The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see it, hear it, we can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. So I wanted to talk this morning about the Buddha's response to war. Um, there's a couple instances we have in the um, Dhammapada commentary that describe uh, background stories where the Buddha is addressing people who aren't getting along. I think with the war in the Ukraine, uh, war is kind of, in the, kind of in the background of our minds, at least it is in mine. It's hard to forget what's going on over there. Um, the first story is called The Dispute Over Water. Um, we think water rights is something new. Well, this is going on 2,500 years ago. Um, same story. Um, there's a limited amount of water. And um, the two groups fighting over the water were the Buddha's relatives, um, the Shakyas, who were his father's people. He was on the Shakya clan at Kapilavastu. And the Koliyas, who were his mother's people in the town of Koliya, these were both really sort of city-states. It's kind of like more kind of the Greek um, arrangement. They weren't really nations or kingdoms, but kind of small city-states in themselves, governing themselves. Um, the water is in the Rohini River. And the story goes, the farmers of both towns irrigated their fields from this river. One year, due to severe drought, their paddy and other crops were threatened, and the farmers on both sides wanted to divert the water from the Rohini River to their own fields. Those living in Kolia wanted to divert and channel the water to irrigate their field. However, the farmers from Kapilavastu protested that they would be denied the use of the water and their crops would be destroyed. Both sides wanted the water for their own use only. And as a result, there was much ill will and hatred on both sides. The quarrel that started between the farmers soon spread like fire, and the matter was reported to their respective rulers. Failing to find a compromise, both sides prepared to go to war. The Buddha came to know that his relatives on both sides of the river were preparing for battle, for their well-being and happiness and to avoid unnecessary suffering. He decided to stop them. All alone, he went and appeared in the middle of the river. His relatives, on seeing him, laid aside all their weapons and paid homage to him. Then the Buddha unmodest them. For the sake of some water, which is of little value, you should not destroy your lives, which are of so much value. Why have you taken this unwholesome course of action? If I had not been here today, your blood would have been flowing like this river by now. In one version of the story, he, he asks them, which is more valuable, blood or water? So he, he tells them, you're living with hatred, but I live free from hatred. You're ailing with moral defilements, but I am free from moral defilements. You're striving to develop selfish, selfishness and enmity, but I don't strive for the development of selfishness. Both sides then became ashamed of their foolishness, and thus bloodshed was averted. Okay. Uh, the story doesn't tell us so, but we assume that they came to some sort of agreement over the water, mm -hmm. and they could share the water and both, both be successful. Um, this story reminds me of uh, a current situation that some of us encountered last week when we went and visited the uh, Lower Klamath Wildlife Refuge. Um, that refuge is uh, one of the, the, the major flyway for uh, wild birds in this half of the country, flowing down from Canada, 
flying down from Canada on to uh, the south. And there's already only 5% of the original refuge left. Okay. And according to the biologist that was talking to us, he was saying that, you know, unless we change something, uh, there's going to be a collapse of the ecosystem there. The birds just can't live without more water. And his opinion was that everyone should come to the table and share the water. Everyone who has the right should come to the table and share the water. And he said there won't be enough for everyone to have what they want, but there will be enough for everyone to have some. It's not as if there is no potential water. It's just a matter of sharing what's already there. Um, it was Karen Armstrong in her book, The Great Transformation, who talked about the great world religions arising in times of violence and chaos in their societies. And they had um, great spiritual teachers like the Buddha, Confucius, Jesus, Muhammad, um, all arising and teaching the people to think outside the clan, okay? Um, the neighbor was someone who was outside one's personal uh, kinfolk, and the emphasis was on compassion. Compassion not for just the people that we love, but compassion for everyone. Not just the people who are close to us, but for our neighbor, for the person down the street or across the world. And I think nowadays we have to think uh, outside the species. Okay. It's very easy for us just to look at our human um, wants and needs and forget about the effect that our actions have on other species as well. I think the, the beautiful nature films that we watch here from time to time really are emphasizing this and showing how these wonderful other species are worth something and it's worth preserving them. And it not only is for their benefit, but it's for our benefit as well. The Buddhist teaching of interconnectedness comes into this. We're all connected. What happens to the, to the flyway up at Lower Klamath affects us. It may be several steps away, and it may be indirectly, but it affects us as well. The other story, um, the Buddha was not so successful. At the time of the Buddha, there were two major kingdoms. One was called Magadha, and the other one was Kosala. The king of Magadha was Bimbasara, who was a follower of the Buddha. And his son was Prince Ajatashatru. The king of Kosala was King Prasenajit, and his son was Prince Virudaka. And both kings were friends of the Buddha. Uh, I'm gonna call Prasenajit Basanadi, which is his, the Pali pronounce, pronunciation, but it's easier for me to say, so. I'm going to call him that. Um, Prince Virudaka, the son of King Pahasanadi, was also known as the Crystal Prince because of the crystal he wore on his forehead. His father, King Pahasanadi, wanted to take over Kapilavastu unless they could find him a suitable bride. The people of Kapilavastu, who were a Shakya clan, found a slave girl and dressed her up to look like royalty. King Pasanati was successfully tricked, and he married the girl. They gave birth to Virudaka, the crystal prince. Later, King Pasanati learned about his wife's true lineage and tries to overthrow Kapilavastu. Interesting enough, his, his son, Virudaka, objects to killing so many people. And Prince Virudaka imprisons King Pasanada, claiming that the king is mentally ill. 
and becomes king himself. Eventually, Buddha convinces him to release his father. King Pasanati walks back to Magadha. He had been imprisoned in Kosala to get an alliance with King Bimbisara and destroy his son, King Virudaka. But King Pasanati dies at the front gate of the Magadha kingdom and wasn't able to make the connection. And this is a longer version of, of the story, but I think it's worth listening to because it's a complex story. There's a number of people involved, and you can see the choices that individuals make that contribute to the ultimate disaster. In the last year of the Buddha's life, so the Buddha's 80 years old at this time, another coup occurred in Shravasti, the capital of Koshala, when King Virudaka took the throne from his father, King Pasanati. The story is full of the worst aspects of human nature, pride, bigotry, paranoia, treachery, and bloody vendettas, all leading up to an act of genocide that even the Buddha found himself unable to prevent. The story really begins during the early years of the Buddha's teaching in Shravasti. The people of Shravasti were not immediately receptive to the Buddha's teachings. Many of them were already partisans of one or another of the so-called six unorthodox teachers who had rejected the authority of the Vedas, the traditional Indian scriptures, and were teaching their own philosophies and methods for attaining liberation. Aside from King Pasanati and his queen Malika, there were many at the palace that only saw the Buddha as a rival to their own favored teacher, and so were less than welcoming. For this reason, the Buddha and his disciples chose not to dine at the palace where they were not welcome, but would accept invitations to eat in the home of the wealthy merchant Sudatta or Visaka, the wife of the wealthy merchant Migara. At one time, King Pasanati asked the Buddha what the best food to offer would be. The Buddha responded that food offered in friendship was best. The Buddha was often taking a, a a practical question and giving it a spiritual answer. In this case, he was doing the same thing. It's not the specific food, but the attitude with which it is given, the food of friendship. The king's ministers, however, misinterpreted this to mean friendship, such as one has with one with one's family and clan. Again, they had a very narrow view of, of who, who one should be friends with. Hoping to make the palace seem more hospitable to the Buddha and the Sangha, King Pasanati decided that he would try to become an in-law of the Buddha by asking the neighboring Shakya clan to send him one of their princesses to become his queen consort. Since the Shakyas also were also believed to be from an ancient lineage of nobles, this would have the added benefit of increasing King Pasanati's prestige increasing ties between his kingdom and theirs. The irony of this is that Shakyamuni had long ago renounced all family ties when he left the palace to seek enlightenment. The Shakyas, however, were too proud and fierce to permit one of their daughters to marry the lowly, in, question, in quotation marks, king of Koshala. The Shakyas were known for their pride. Okay, this comes up in other stories as well in relation to the Buddha and his uh, efforts to teach his fellow uh, kinfolk. The Shakyas, however, could not openly defy King Prasenati because Kasala was a much larger and more powerful kingdom that could easily crush them. So a Shakya noble named Mahanama proposed that his beautiful 16-year-old daughter Vasa Katiya be sent. The girl's mother was one of Mahanama's slaves a woman by the name of Nagamunda. The writer of this uh, tale says, is it possible that Nagamunda was a member of the Nagas, a tribe of Aborigines who even today live in northeastern India? But in any case, she was a slave. Vasubhakatiya was regarded as no better than a slave herself 
and slaves were not permitted to even eat out of the same dishes as the Shakya nobles. The Koshala emissary knew this, and so Mahatama arranged to make it seem as though he and his slave daughter were eating from the same bowl by inviting her to dine with him in the presence of the emissary, or the, the ambassador. Then at the last moment, he arranged to be called away so that we would not have to eat anything from the bowl out of which Vasa Bakatiya had eaten. The emissary did not catch on to the ruse and believed that the girl was in fact a Shakya princess. Though they regarded her as no more than chattel, the Shakyas saw her off with ceremony to one of their actual princesses. When she arrived in Shravasti, the capital of Kosala, she was anointed the new queen consort in a lavish ceremony. She soon became the king's favorite among his many queens, and all the more when she gave birth to Virudaka, the crown prince. So here we have the story set up for um, later misfortune. As Prince Vibhudaka grew up, he began to realize that his grandparents on his mother's side in Kapilavastu never acknowledged him or sent him toys or other presents the way the maternal grandparents of the other princes did. His mother refused to speak of them and simply told him that they were too far away to send presents. When Prince Vibhudaka was 16, he insisted on visiting his grandparents and other relatives in Kapilavastu and would not be dissuaded. Vasavakatiya sent a messenger ahead of the prince, begging her former masters not to reveal the truth of Prince Vibhudaka's ancestry. For their part, the Shakyas were willing to cover up the truth, but not willing to have their children tainted by the presence of a slave son who mistakenly believed he was their equal. They had set up the situation for the, for the man to be a, a part slave, and yet they were unable or unwilling to have him mixed with their children as well. They sent their princes off into the countryside where they would be out of the way. Prince Virudaka stayed at a rest house that was prepared for him and was able to meet his grandfather Mahanama. He was treated in a civil fashion, if rather coolly. It all fell apart when Prince Vibhudaka left, for one of his entourage forgot his spear and ran back to the rest house for it. There the soldiers saw the Shakya slaves cleaning all the furnishings that Prince Vibhudaka had used. And they used milk, actually, to, to clean all the, the stools and tables and the beds, everything that, that Prince Vibhudaka the, um, had used. He asked them about this and found out that Prince Virudaka was considered an outcast because his mother was in actuality a slave and not a princess. When this was reported back to Prince Virudaka, he was enraged. Even worse, even worse when King Pasanati found out, in order to protect himself from scandal, he had to strip Virudaka and his mother of all rank and relegate them to the slave quarters. Shortly thereafter, however, the Buddha spoke to King Pasanati. They were friends enough that he could communicate with the king and, and, and gave him some advice. He acknowledged that the Shakyas had behaved wrongly, but then convinced King Pasanati that what he had done to Prince Virudaka and his mother was unnecessary. It was how one lived and acted that one should determine one's status and not accident of birth. Here's the Buddha again speaking out against the, the caste system, saying, it's what you do that makes you noble. Okay. Vasa Bhakatiya had been anointed a queen and had lived up to the part, and Vrivardaka was the son of a king and had been raised to be the designated heir. King Pasanati heeded the Buddha's advice and restored Vasa Bhakatiya as his queen in Virudaka as the crown prince. However, Prince Virudaka would never forget this humiliation. 
he determined to avenge himself against the Shakyas, going so far as to hire a Brahmin to remind him of the following vow three times a day. When I become king, I will see to it that the Shakyas' homes are washed again in their own blood. Meanwhile, later, another tragic palace intrigue occurred in Shravasti. It must have, must have been a hard time to be alive and be a, a noble. <laughs> Sometime after Queen Malika passed away, King Prasanavi was disconsolate and was unable to concentrate on affairs of state. Corrupt ministers took advantage of this situation to enrich their friends and themselves. But the king's commander-in-chief, Bandula, attempted to institute reforms. Bandula was a man of integrity and a lay follower of the Buddha. He tried to put an end to bribery and restore impartiality and justice to the courts. The corrupt ministers then slandered Bandula to the king. King Prasenati came to believe that Bandula was plotting to overthrow him. But since Prince but since Bandula was so popular with the people, he could not publicly arrest and execute him without risking a rebellion. Instead, he arranged for mercenaries to attack the frontiers of Koshala so that he could order Bandula and his 32 sons to march out and subdue them. While Bandula, Bandula searched for the raiders, assassins planted in the arm by the corrupt ministers killed him and all his sons and brought their heads back to the king. The reaction of Bandu's widow, Malika, same name as the, the king's wife, but a different person. The reaction of Bandu's widow, Malika, as well as the widows of his sons, was to reproach the king in stoic silence. King Pasanati was perhaps a foolish ruler, but he was not entirely unjust. He questioned Malika and learned that Bandula had been falsely accused. Filled with remorse, he begged for forgiveness of Malika and the other widows. Malika forgave him, and she and the other widows returned to their parents' homes in peace. And that's a real significant, because usually widows were outcasts. But in this, the way they worked it out, the, the women could return to their parents' homes. King Pasanati then appointed Bandu's nephew, nephew Diga Karayana, the new commander-in-chief. Unfortunately for King Pasanati, Diga Karayana had not forgiven him, but bore a deep grudge. He constantly found fault with the king and looked for opportunities to avenge his family, thinking, this king murdered my uncle and cousins. Diga Karayana's chance came one day when King Pasanati decided to visit the Buddha, who was staying in a small Shakyan village. The king, like the Buddha, was now 80 years old. He was old and lonely and full of regrets, so he often sought out the Buddha's consolation. Leaving his carriage behind, he walked into the park where the Buddha was staying. Before entering the Buddha's dwelling place, he left his royal insignia with Diga Karayana, who was to remain outside with the royal guard. The insignia consisted of his shoes, parasol, fan, turban, and sword. And these were all symbols of his royalty and his position as, as king. Dika Karayana was beset by both temptation and paranoid fears. He was tempted to seize the royal insignia and overthrow the king in favor of Prince Virudaka. At the same time, he feared that even as he waited outside, the king and the Buddha might be scheming against him, just as the king and his ministers had schemed against his uncle. There's the, there's the fear, the paranoia coming into it. Diga Karayana felt that he had no choice. And of course, that's where delusion enters in. He felt that he had no choice other than take advantage of the opportunity to avenge his uncle and cousins that he had been looking for. He gathered up the royal guards and left with the chariots, leaving only a single servant woman behind. He brought the royal insignia to Prince Virudaka 
and demanded that he take the throne. Prince Virudaka may still have harbored resentment against his father for having been temporarily sent to the slave quarters along with his mother before the Buddha intervened. He may also have been concerned that Diga Karayana could just as easily have put him to death and become king himself. In any case, he accepted the royal insignia and became the new king of Kosala. In the meantime, King Pasanali, who was still with the Buddha, having a you know, conversation, discovered that he had been abandoned and that he had lost the throne. With a serving woman who was helping him, who was quite devoted to him, he walked to Raja Griha to seek out the help of his nephew, King Ajatashatru, who, of course, is the son of King Bimbasara. But he had taken the throne at that point and was now the king. The two had become friends since their last battle when King Pasanati had captured Ajatashatru and then allowed him to return home in peace. Unfortunately for him, for King Pasanati, the city's gates were already closed for the night and the ragged old king, bereft of his insignia, was not able to convince the guards to let him through. He stayed in an inn outside the walls, but the toll of the long journey on foot without provisions had been too great for the old king, and he passed away in the night. The next day, King, Aj king Ajatru learned what had happened from the grieving servant woman, but there was nothing more he could do other than recognize King Virudaka as the new ruler of Kosala. King Virudaka was now able to move against the Shakya clan, old grudge, still carrying that, that grudge against the Shakyas. He gathered his army and marched on Kapilavastu. The Buddha, had, however, had gone ahead of the army and was waiting for them at the outskirts of the city, sitting beneath a dead tree. King Virudaka saw the Buddha sitting there and asked him why he did not sit under the shade of the trees in the Nagroda Park. The Buddha said, it is one's own relations who provide the coolest shade. King Virudaka understood that the Buddha was asking him to spare his kinsmen. Out of deference to the Buddha, King Virudaka took his army back to Shravasti. King Virudaka may also have also felt a sense of gratitude to the Buddha for helping him when King Pasanati had sent him and his mother to the slave quarters. The Brahmin, however, who he had um, hired to remind him about his vow, continued to um, remind Virudaka of the vow to bathe Kapilavastu in the blood of the Shakyas. And so after a while, he set out with his army again. Again, the Buddha intervened and the army returned to Shravasti. And then a third time this happened. But on the fourth occasion when King Virudaka and his army set out, the Buddha stayed at the Jetta Grove Monastery. He realized that in remonstrating with the king on the previous three occasions, he had done all he could, but the King Virudaka's grudge would not abate. The Shakyas were doomed as the result of their previous deception against Prasenaji and rejection of Virudaka. The seeds of hatred, the seeds of karma, they had sowed on the basis of their overbearing pride in their lineage were coming to fruition. King Virudaka raised Kapilavastu and massacred the Shakyas, though a few escaped to build a new city in a different location afterwards. So I, this story comes to mind a lot as we think about the uh, people in Ukraine who are being overrun by the Russians. And what do we do? You know, what do we do to uh, a situation where something seems unfair? And if we follow the Buddha's example, we do whatever we can. The Buddha tried three times you know, to stop this war, but in the end he wasn't successful. And he had to draw back and rest in his uh, equanimity, which is one of the four uh, Brahma Viharas or immeasurables. It reminds me a lot of what, um, well, what um, Shantideva recommends in the Buddha's way of life. 
um, if you see a, a difficult situation, try to do something about it. But if you can't do something about it, why worry? Okay, and it isn't, it's not meant to be flippant, but it meant that if you can't do something about a situation, um, don't worry about it. Don't dwell on it. Just offer it up, offer the merit up, and get on with what you can do something about. Um, this reminds me of how the Dalai Lama has approached his situation with Tibet. The Chinese overran Tibet that's 60 years ago, and the, the Dalai Lama has been his, the rest of his life trying to come to some accord with the Chinese. And for all intents and purposes, he really hasn't been very ex successful. But he's done what he could. He established um, his people in um, um, a... Um, Immigrant, not an immigrant, but um, um, anyway, a people who live outside their own country, and uh, has done all his can to preserve the religion. Has done all his can to educate the children of uh, the Tibetan refugees, and continues to welcome those who are able to escape from Tibet and give them his help. The story ends with, a, with another unpleasant twist, which I'll include because it, it rounds out the story. Upon returning to Shavasti, King Virudaka sought out his brother Prince Jetta. You may remember Prince Jetta is the one who um, um, gave the, the gold to cover the, the last portion of the Jetta's grove. Um, which his brother uh, was giving to the Buddha as a monastery. So this Prince Jetta. As a lay follower of the Buddha, Prince Jetta had refused to participate in the disruption of the Shakyas. His response may not be that admirable, but instead he stayed behind in the palace, seeking out women and music as a diversion. Angered by Prince Jetta's defiance, King Virudaka killed him. So ended the lives of the Buddha's clan and his last royal patron in Shravasti. Seven days later, while encamped on a riverbank, King Virudaka and his army were swept away by a flash flood. <laughs> they reaped the karmic consequence of what they had done. But there's a, there's a note in the commentary that explains that Actually, it was the karmic consequence of a past life where they had poisoned the fish in the lake. Okay. And this was the karmic consequence of that, that they then in turn were drowned by this river that overflowed its banks. So I think the important point in this story is, is to do whatever you can and then to accept what is, is there. There are many things in life we can't do anything about, but there are many things that we can do. And it's important to focus our efforts on the places where we can make a difference. In closing, I'll just mention that um, the question arises, is this, this all factually true? Okay, It's sometimes called a legend. Um, the author writes it as a legend, but he draws on many different sources to make a whole story. And as one old Theravada monk said to one of us, it doesn't matter if it factually happened or not, it's still true. Okay? These legends are still true. There's a truth embedded in them that teaches us something about the law of karma. It's very much like a stained glass window the light coming through the window is colored, but it's still light. It gives us some insight into the nature of light. Okay. Um, we see a, an image on the window, but it's still light. It may not be pure light, but it's still light. And it has something there to teach us and show us about the nature of light. I'll close there. And Thank you all for being here today. May you all be well and happy. <laughs>